Good evening and thank you for joining us. Continued mistrust of Thunder Bay Police Service has prompted Indigenous leaders to call on the province to intervene. They want the service to eventually be dismantled, but in the meantime, they're demanding that an outside agency take over all major crime investigations. MPP Saul Mamakwa hosted a news conference at Queen's Park in Toronto this morning. Lee Noonan reports. The various calls asked for the police service to be overseen by the OPP, for them to be removed from major crime investigations, and to be dismantled entirely. Kiwetnung MPP Saul Mamakwa called for the oversight of the Thunder Bay Police Service. Solicitor General Sylvia Jones responded, saying allegations against the Thunder Bay Police were already being investigated through the Ontario Civilian Police Commission and the OPP. Systemic racism within the Thunder Bay Police is preventing justice for Indigenous people, and it is intolerable. Will this government immediately call for OPP oversight of the Thunder Bay Police? Those investigations must happen in order, exactly as you said, to bring back trust and faith in the police services in Thunder Bay and elsewhere. We've done that, those investigations are ongoing, and we should not and cannot politically interfere in those independent uh, reviews as they take place. The exchange followed a press conference hosted by Mamakwa in which Anishinaabek Nation and Anishinaabe Aski Nation made a joint statement co-signed by the Thunder Bay Indigenous Friendship Centre. They called on the Solicitor General of Ontario to dismantle the Thunder Bay Police Service and for an immediate moratorium on all major crime investigations by the Thunder Bay Police. Both organizations expressed a lack of faith in the competence of the Thunder Bay Police to investigate the deaths of Indigenous people and a frustration with studies and reports examining racism in the police service. Anishinaabek Nation Grand Chief Raj Niganobi says police institutions are unwilling and unable to make substantive change, filing reports away to be forgotten until the next incident. The Thunder Bay Police Service leaves a trail of inadequate investigations, a negligently managed record system, and a lack of substantive oversight. Trust is broken, and every day Thunder Bay Police Service remains in control of major crime investigations and another day Indigenous people are at risk in the city. NAN Deputy Grand Chief Anna Betty Achnipaneskim focused on the issue of reinvestigations and the anger and mistrust of families whose loved ones' deaths have been inadequately investigated. No more families should have to endure this racism and continued victimization at the hands of the police. Mayor Bill Morrow issued a statement saying he welcomes the opportunity to discuss the police service and other issues facing the city with NAN Grand Chief Jarek Fox. Meanwhile, Police Board Chair Kristen Oliver issued a written statement saying that more work needs to be done to rebuild relationships. The Police Board will be convening an emergency meeting on Saturday, which will be closed to the public and media. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Thunder Bay MPPs Judith Montes Farrell and Michael Gravel are divided on the question of what action, if any, should be taken by the province regarding the Thunder Bay Police. Montes Farrell reiterated her NDP colleagues' call for OPP oversight of the city police force and spoke in support of the First Nations leaders who are calling for immediate action. It isn't interference to have an organization come and oversee. We've had that happen in the past with our police services board. It's not inappropriate for, for, an, you know, for the province to assure people that are in this area. That's what reconciliation looks like. Thunder Bay Superior North MPP Michael Gravel says he agrees with the Ford government that the ongoing investigation into the police service should be allowed to be played out. Well, in the meantime, Thunder Bay Police continue to work in the community. The service has released a series of videos to help educate young people about the dangers of gangs. The force enlisted the help of those who spent years as members. A screening was held last night featuring people who were previously involved in the drug trade and human trafficking. Corey Nordstrom has more. Dozens gathered inside the Victoria Inn ballroom for the debut of the four videos aimed at preventing local youth from getting involved with gangs. A woman named Jessica was the focus of one video after she spent years in the sex trade all across Canada, losing friends to the violence of the business. She was killed that night and I knew at that point that this was not a game. This was not something that was fun. This wasn't going to parties and looking pretty. 
Kyle Arnold was on hand for the screening of his story, outlining his 20 years as a drug dealer and user while a part of a gang. He's now clean and working to help others who are written off as too far gone. In his view, the youth hearing from someone with lived experience will make a huge difference in their decision to avoid gang life. Well, I hope it impacts them um, in a way that they really take the time to, you know, make those good choices. Um, I hope that it uh, shows them that life isn't a music video, you know, that there is consequences for our actions um, and that we need to really, you know, reach out for help. Also part of the gang prevention initiative, spoken word poet Wally Shaw, who created a poem to inspire the youth, visited them in the classroom. By meeting with high schoolers and showing his craft, he wants to let them know there are other avenues to work through hardships than turning to a life of crime. Whether it's dance or drama or whatever else, to be able to connect and engage artistically with some of these kids that are dealing with a lot of struggles, whether it's like gang violence or drug abuse or anxiety, depression, like just having something creative to latch onto, that's where you get the greatest response and feedback from these kids. The Thunder Bay Police Service has already posted Shaw's video and the rest will be made public throughout the week. So we can see how that's uh, being accepted and, and how it resonates with the youth and, and what it's doing for them. Uh, we will build on that. So what, is it, what comes next? Well, maybe we'll look at doing work, work, uh, writing workshops with them. We want to change the narrative about what there is to do here and really uh, looking at people becoming vulnerable in a, in a good way. The gang prevention initiative was made possible through funds from the Ontario government. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. Members of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table say it's clear that Ontario is now in the middle of a sixth wave of the pandemic. But they say the surge in cases isn't being driven by the BA.2 Omicron subvariant, but by the decision to ease restrictions across the province. Raheem Ladani reports. It's the situation nobody wanted, but many saw coming. When they dropped the mask mandates, they pretty much guaranteed this would happen. With public health measures in Ontario all but lifted, COVID-19 hospitalizations are once again rising. It's been uh, about 100 people more in the last week alone. Um, this is a sign when you plot it, it looks exp exponential again. The province, though, insists hospitals are in a position to manage any projected surge, while also clearing the surgical backlog caused by the pandemic. Now, that doesn't undermine the significance of this wave. We don't want anyone to get COVID. We don't want anyone to get sick. We don't want anyone to go to hospital. We don't want anyone to die. In the United States, a fourth vaccine dose has been approved for those 50 and older, and Canada may soon follow, still forced to adapt to the virus. There's a lot of expectations that the fall will bring another wave. So when you time that fourth dose, do you time it now to address part of what we're seeing or to try and time it against having lingering protection heading into the fall? While the spread of COVID-19 appears to be scaling up again, the Ford government is not planning to bring back widespread PCR testing. The health minister saying PCR testing continues to be readily available for those living and working in the highest risk settings. Adding, 5 million rapid tests are available to the general public every week, including at assessment centers for those that don't require a PCR test. But the number of cases that are happening today, where they're happening and the degree of spread, there is value still in trying to track that. As the true number of people infected remains unknown. Love CTV's Raheem Ladani. Here in our region, tragically, there's been another COVID-19 related death. 83 people have now died with the virus across the Thunder Bay District Health Unit's catchment area since the start of the pandemic. And while COVID hospitalizations continue to rise across the province, that's not the case yet at the Regional Health Sciences Centre. There are now 23 COVID-19 patients at the Regional Hospital, down one from Tuesday. And the number of those patients in the ICU has dipped from 8 to 7. The hospital occupancy rate stands at nearly 99% with the occupancy rate in intensive care now below 73%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 62 new COVID-19 infections since its last update on Monday. However, actual case numbers are believed to be much higher as testing capacity has been reduced across the province. There are 118 known active cases across the district. Last week's incidence rate fell to 130 cases per 100,000 people, but the test positivity rate rose from 12.5 to 13.3 percent. 
Over in the Northwestern Health Unit, there are 259 reported active cases. The seven-day test positivity rate there sits at 16.1%. It's another big milestone in the effort to four-lane the Trans-Canada Highway near Kenora. Minister Greg Rickford's office announced today that Moncrief Construction, based in Kenora, has been awarded the contract to twin Highway 17 in that area. No dollar figure was provided for the big job that will see 40 kilometers of the highway four-laned between the Manitoba-Ontario border and the Highway 17A turnoff to Kenora. Construction of the first section is scheduled to begin this spring. That phase spans six and a half kilometers from the border to the Highway 673 turnoff. It will create more than 300 jobs until that work is finished in the summer of 2025. There's no timeline for construction on the other two larger sections, as that won't begin until an environmental assessment, route planning and design work is complete. Some changes to the Thunder Bay Transit fare system will take effect on Friday, as the city tries to increase ridership. One change is to make more kids eligible for free rides, expanding that eligibility from 5 and under to 12 and under. Additionally, discounted monthly passes will be available to more young people, as those defined as youth jump from 18 years old to 24. The goal is to make transit more accessible to youth and families. Transit manager Brad Loroff says the changes are part of a three-year pilot project. Ridership trends and financial impact are the two key factors that the city will consider moving forward. It'll be reviewed on an annual basis just to see what the performance is and what the impacts are. Um, from a revenue perspective, um, there is only uh, uh, opportunity to go up because children and youth ridership is relatively low uh, and doesn't make up a large percentage of our ridership. So again, it's, it's, it, we see it as a really good growth opportunity. The new transit structure will also make it easier for all riders to transfer from one bus to another. The window of time for that is expanding from an hour to an hour and a half. The plan to build a dome over a local 15-court racket sport facility is still moving forward, but with a few changes. The local tennis center is currently working with the city to update options for Chapels Park. Our report on that is coming to council on Monday. It will include recommendations on the preferred location as well as several workable alternatives. Tennis Centre Board Vice President Passy Pinta says he's optimistic the two sides can collaborate to find a suitable path forward for the project. The primary challenge has been trying to squeeze everything onto the land at Chapels Park. But Pinta and City Community Services General Manager Kelly Robertson say the new report addresses that issue. They're trying to move the project along as quickly and efficiently as possible. We need to check in with, with council and, and get their direction on accepting the change in, in direction and, uh, and, and trying to achieve consensus on uh, this new project and the location within the park. Uh, construction season is, is coming upon us very, very quickly. Um, hoping against hope that uh, we'll still have time to complete some or all of the project this year. Pinta says a new facility would allow the city to host a number of events since it would be the only facility of its kind between Winnipeg and Sudbury. The Port of Thunder Bay welcomed its first two ships of the 2022 navigation season early this morning and the honor of who would be the first to dock was a race to the finish. The bulk carrier, the Mishapakotan, narrowly edged out the Captain Henry Jackman by just 30 minutes. The big grain vessel operated by Lower Lakes Towing docked at the Superior Elevator at 4.30 this morning. The two vessels had been held up for four days by gale force winds in Sault Ste. Marie before starting their voyage across Lake Superior. Unfortunately, the poor weather followed the ships, forcing the cancellation of the traditional top hat ceremony. Two more ships are expected to arrive tomorrow. Port Author Authority CEO Tim Heaney says they expect to be quite busy over the next month. Yeah, there's a couple of more vessels that'll be in uh, tomorrow. Uh, and then after that, the, the next ships will be in next week. So it starts to go pretty regular after that. And, uh, you know, usually by the end of April, we've shipped about a million tons through the port on average. So it, it can be a fairly busy month uh, at the start of the season. 
It'll be a quick turnaround for the Mishapa Cotton. After loading up with its shipment of oats, the vessel will leave Thunder Bay overnight en route to Toledo, Ohio. Well, Fiona.